Welcome back, Word Nerds. Mike here with The Social Life of Language, making complex theory simple but never simplified. If you think that sounds cool, hit that subscribe button now. Today we'll be covering an article by Kendra Calhoun titled, Vine Racial Comedy as Anti-Hegemonic Humor, Linguistic Performance and Generic Innovation. Plus, we got another book giveaway. This time we'll be giving away Signs of Difference by Irving and Gal, which is sure to become scripture at some point. Yes. Yes. But you gotta stay all the way to the end to receive the instructions to figure out how you can win. Super easy, just like last time. So Calhoun goes deep into the recently shut down platform called Vine and analyzes the racial humor of two videos from the Viner King Batch. So let's watch the first video. How are you two fine gentlemen doing this evening? I was wondering if you'd like to- Hey man, I should just shout out with your fat ass, bro. I can't, I'm like, shit, you gonna give me your number, bro. All right, so funny shit, but it makes you think. So there are several ways to enter this article, but let's look towards the title for some guidance, specifically the part, Vine racial comedy as anti-hegemonic humor. So I'm thinking we need to focus on that big ass word, anti-hegemonic. By the end of this video, I want you to walk away with that concept in your back pocket, but also a better sense of how beliefs about language and race are always overlapping, are always co-constituting one another. Meaning beliefs about language help create beliefs about race and vice versa. Now there's tons of definitions to the word hegemony or what kinds of ideas are hegemonic. But I kind of like the phrase models of perception armored by popular consent. That's just how I think about it and that's not how everybody thinks about it. But let's think of an example. In the US, we don't have a king forcing beliefs down onto people. We have things like mass media disseminating information and ideological stances that people can align with or disalign with. But we feel as though we have a choice about it. To a certain degree, we choose to believe aspects of these media produced popular models of perception. And then we get a chance to defend those models of perception by choice. For example, when we vote in elections, we're choosing to participate. So hegemonic beliefs become armored by popular consent. These beliefs become so common, we don't even think about them anymore. Think about that hegemonic belief from the conservative perspective that says immigrants are taking our jobs. While at the exact same time, they can brag about the lowest unemployment rates in the history of the United States. So hegemonic ideas don't need to make sense per se. They're more ideas that saturate our consciousness that seem to make sense no matter what. Let's think of another example. When we think of DACA or dreamers, why does a picture of a specifically Latinx brown body pop into our head? Now we have dreamers from Poland, from Canada, from Jamaica. This tells us that ideology is not just reserved for the realm of words and texts running through our heads. Something that is hegemonic can be thought of as a model of perception that also guides us to read meanings into stuff like skin color or how a person sounds when they speak. They might sound foreign, they might sound Mexican, they might sound black. Let's watch that video one more time looking for the hegemonic beliefs that are being critiqued. How are you two fine gentlemen doing this evening? I was wondering if you'd like to- Hey man, I should just shout out with not your fat ass, bro. I can't, I was like, shit, you gonna give me your number, bro. Now remember, hegemonic ideas fade far into the background and appear to be invisible to all or most people. Each time we see this stereotypical black character on TV or any form of media, it reproduces this hegemonic stereotype, this model of perception that says, all black Americans sound like this. In this video, however, we have King Batch intentionally reproducing this hegemonic stereotype, but shows you that this model of perception is not common to all people, but it's a powerful stereotype from the perspective rooted in whiteness and racist ideologies. So pay attention to those capitalized words in the title, what they hear when we talk. So what he does is particularize this model of perception and presents it as a model only certain people from certain groups believe. So it's framed explicitly not as a hegemonic belief. And bam, just like that, this commentary can be viewed as anti-hegemonic or making visible a dominant 
hegemonic model of perception that is invisible for some people. And Calhoun names that hegemonic belief, page 40, for black speakers, no matter how formal or standard their speech is, it is still very likely that they will be perceived negatively. So here she describes the hegemonic model of perception that racializes both language practice and bodies simultaneously. So in this vibe, in just a few seconds, a critique emerges through spoken words, through the text in the title, through skin color of actors, through bodily movements and gestures, through background music, all working together to create racial meanings and racial humor. Calhoun is going beyond an analysis of just verbal or textual language. This is an analysis that is multimodal. So what she's doing is walking us through the ongoing process of assembling signs or assembling meanings that all play off of one another in different forms. Not just the language part, not just the words and the texts, but an overall wider semiotic process. Let's look at the second King Batch video analyzed in this article, which I think is a bit more complicated. What are you doing? What, a black man can't have a TV? No, you can be black and have a TV. Yeah, yeah. go put his mask on because it's cold out. Yeah, for mm -hmm. sure. So we gotta remember, humor and comedy is open to interpretation. The response from black audience members was pretty mixed. So we need to ask why. So for me, I knew it was funny seeing white cops tricked and being insecure. But also I had to admit, this has the potential to be read by some people as a serious problem. Think of one of those right-wing commentators who's constantly accusing POCs of always playing the race card. Imagine him watching this video and being like, always playing the race card. Everything's racist to these people. Cops need to do their jobs. So Calhoun warns us, like other forms of humor that negotiate race and other sociopolitical issues, particularly those that utilize stereotypes, there is always the risk that audiences will not fully understand the subversive nature of anti-hegemonic vine racial comedy. What I think is powerful about this video is it highlights that in the US, where it's supposedly impolite to talk about race ever, it foregrounds this hegemonic belief. Now this belief mostly works to the benefit of white identifying populations. It becomes a quick and easy way to dismiss people. But in this video, that scenario is flipped. But you know, it took me a while to get there and I definitely didn't get that kind of analysis in the six seconds I had to watch. But again, this is from the standpoint of a Mexican American watching this video. Certain aspects of this humor, certain hegemonic beliefs will become visible to some more than others. Each of our positions in society will shape the way we read signs. Okay, so let's squeeze in one more keyword from this article. Although this word isn't particularly foregrounded, I think that if you really understand this word, it'll make everything else easier. The word is affordance. The word affordance is a complicated word that plagued my existence when I first entered this multimodal studies world. So this word definitely implies that we're going beyond text and words. So here's my really quick definition. Affordances are likelihoods and limitations produced by an environment, or in this case, produced by a media environment, produced by a platform. An environment affords possibilities. What does that mean? Okay, so let's think about a couple different media environments and what they afford. A podcast environment limits a creator to audio, which makes likely a far more elaborate attention to things like music or sound effects. Likewise, the Vine platform affords its own possibilities. For example, videos are limited to being six seconds long. That is literally a time limitation of the Vine environment, of the Vine platform. But likelihoods will also emerge when creators are forced to squeeze material into six seconds. In this case, King Batch ends up relying on stereotypes to import a massive amount of historical data, a massive amount of historical meanings instantly. So when you read this article, every time that word affordance comes out, try to think it's the likelihoods and limitations 
produced by some environment, which makes only certain stuff possible. Taking all these possibilities together, all the limitations and all the likelihoods, the Vine platform also made possible the emergence of a particular genre to emerge within King Batch's videos. Calhoun calls this particular selection a anti-hegemonic Vine racial comedy genre. But one of the major points of this article is that racial comedy on Vine pulls from, interacts with, is an effect of many genres of racial comedy. But this particular genre within King Batch's videos emerged this way through the interaction of all of these other genres along with affordances that the Vine platform makes possible. See what I did there with the word? Nobody cares. Now, unfortunately, we won't be able to go over the word genre here, but I do have an older video. Click here. Okay, so that's all for today. I hope you got a running start into this article, but now the instructions on how to win this book. All you gotta do is comment down below and I'll put your name in the drawing. And in seven days, I will announce the winner on Twitter and Facebook and email you. That's it, that's all you gotta do. This is Mike with The Social Life of Language. Like and subscribe, and don't forget to visit my Patreon page if you wanna give me money. And we're done.